Thank you, <clears throat> Brother Brandon. We're we'll reading from Psalm 93. Well, I've been a church leader for <clears throat> quite a few years. I'd have to think to figure out how many, but <clears throat> of course you have a lot of experiences in, uh, in that responsibility. Uh, I had a pastor call me. He wanted to buy another church and, well, sell the one they had, but get a better setup and <clears throat> so I drove to that city to look at what he had found. And uh, I won't tell you which denomination, and it wouldn't necessarily reflect against the denomination, but the local church. But it uh, is a nice appearing building. It was in the wintertime. And uh, <clears throat> we pulled up to it to look at it with him. And, and I noted every sidewalk on the block was cleared but the church and i thought what a reflection on god and on that local church uh, never said a word to them about it of course but i thought of that when i drove up here tonight and i thought <clears throat> You're handicapped because you don't have a resident pastor at the time. And yet every time my wife and I have been honored to come here, this church has looked so inviting and so clean and presentable. And that is a wonderful testimony. And I just want to commend you for that. And then thinking about those songs, we had some good songs to sing tonight. <clears throat> I always look at the author and also who provided the music. And uh, the one song we, we sang, it was uh, Samuel Wesley was the author. And it gave 1840, or maybe it was 1860, I forget. Anyway, uh, I think it was 1864 maybe. Well, he no doubt was a part of the Wesley family I've had the privilege of standing ahead of barrier, you couldn't touch it, but standing right there at Charles Wesley's personal organ and uh, looking at it, saw where John and Charles were buried and Adam Clark and, and uh, <clears throat> Susanna Wesley, that great mother of Methodism. She's across the street from the Wesley Chapel in what's called Bunfield Hills cemetery you couldn't get up next to her grave you could get over to isaac watts we sang one of his songs and uh, he was contemporary with the wesleys but john died in 1791 so that would put his death about well almost 70 years ahead of whoever wrote this song samuel whichever one that was uh, they were quite a family uh, John was child number 17. Charles was number 19. And uh, <clears throat> years ago, I held a revival in Indianapolis, and the pastor took me to a used bookstore. And it had a very good religious section. I'm sure I bought a bunch of books. Uh, I'm trying to call out books out of my library. I'm an old man, and uh, I don't know if all my... Kids, I do have preacher boys in our family, several, and uh, uh, <clears throat> I'm sure they have some of the books I have, but I've been getting rid of books, and actually, I think I've gotten rid of almost as many as I bought the last couple of years. <laughs> but, but anyway, uh, <clears throat> years after that revival in Indianapolis, I was driving through Indianapolis going home from a revival and I thought of that bookstore and I just prayed, Lord, help me find it. And I turned off of Interstate 70 and the Lord must have helped me. I drove right to it and uh, walked in and brother, had it changed. I thought, I don't want to be seen in here. 
But I thought, I, I'm here. I'm going to go see if they still have a religious section. So I walked back where it was, and sure enough, they did. It wasn't as good as it used to be, but I walked up to it, and right in front of me was the Memoirs of the Wesleys by Adam Clark. And I picked it up, bought it, and got out of there. <laughs> but I've read that book, of course, and, uh, oh, it is so interesting. I think my wife's read that one. It talks about Jeffrey the ghost that the Wesley family had and, and uh, the difference in politics between... Uh, I think his name was Samuel, the father of John. I think it was Samuel. Samuel Annesley was Susanna's father. He was also a preacher. And my wife mentioned being born in a Christian home. Susanna talked about the accident of birth when she looked at the home she was born into and looked at the awful condition of London. But uh, anyway... That was interesting to me, and which Samuel that was. Charles had two sons that were just absolute uh, prodigies. Uh, one of them, I think, played the organ proficiently at about age four. And they, they just, they were quite a family. But then the, the Majesty, that song, that was written by Jack Hayford. Now, I don't know if he's still living. He may be. But he pastored a four-square church in California. Now, that's a tongues church. But he was the first one to make a pastoral call on Dr. James Dobson when Dr. Dobson lived in California and had that major heart attack. <clears throat> I, uh, I used to have my name on the outside of my uh, briefcase, attache. That's, those things have even changed over the years. And I was flying to a revival meeting, and I was in an airport, and I had set my briefcase down or whatever it was I had, and it had my name on it. And a man standing by me looked down at it, and he said, Jack Hayford, by the way, had a major television program where he preached uh, over the television. And so he was known nationally. This fellow looked down my briefcase, saw my name. He looked at me with his eyes bugging out. He said, are you Reverend Hayford? I said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Do you preach on television? I don't remember what I said, but if I'd have been thinking, I probably would have said every chance I get. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but uh, anyway, <clears throat> uh, very interesting things. But thank God for the way of holiness. Uh, by the way, thinking, I love church history, and I, I love, I'm not a singer, but I love uh, hymn history, and uh, <clears throat> some tremendous stories behind that. Uh, did you know George Beverly Shea was raised in a Wesleyan Methodist parsonage? And he was named after Beverly Carradine, the great Methodist preacher, writer. And he, as a teenager, <clears throat> was called on in a revival meeting where Fred Sutcliffe was the evangelist and Sister Sutcliffe was with him. And uh, George Bev Shea was probably about 17 and he sang a solo. He did such a poor job he vowed never to do it again. Sutcliffe pled with him, don't give up, to try again. Well, he did. But uh, Brother Sutcliffe is the one that wrote the song, Little is Much, If God is in It. And that was all in Canada. It's where uh, Bev Shea's uh, father pastored a Wesleyan Methodist church. But speaking of Dr. Dobson, his father was saved under Brother Albert Dodd. And you may have heard of Brother Dodd. He was a district superintendent in the Louisiana district of the Nazarenes for 18 years. When I was a student at BMI, he became a Bible missionary general moderator and served in that capacity for years. What a great leader and great soul winner. But Jimmy, they called him, Jimmy Dobson be Dr. James Dobson's father, was saved under Brother Albert Dodd. 
And uh, Brother or Dr. Dobson's mother helped Deline Stockton. You may not know who that was. You probably know she's still living, isn't she? Nearly 100 years old. Her father, John Stockton, was the general treasurer of the Nazarene Church. She fell in love with a preacher boy by the name of Spencer Johnson there at Bethany Nazarene College. And Spencer Johnson, of course, he, he's been in heaven now a few years, but became a great soul winner and church leader. And uh, anyway, the Stocktons were opposed to her marrying this man, Brother Spencer Johnson. So... Uh, I forget her first name now, but Jimmy Dobson's wife, Dr. James Dobson's mother, helped Delene Stockton elope with Brother Spencer Johnson. And uh, as one of my mentors used to say, a lot of unwritten church history. <laughs> and I, I like it all, the written and the unwritten. But I thank God for men and women that blazed a trail for you and me, and the wonderful holiness heritage that we have, and thank God for it. I'll tell you, where would I be if there hadn't been some that were faithful to me? And uh, I was a sports nut. I played all the sports in high school, and uh, <clears throat> my first love was basketball. And holiness preachers came to North Dakota to my parents' home. They, they were in a church that was drifting and uh, compromise everywhere. And one of those holiness preachers, well, I was just rejoicing because I had an athletic banquet that night. And I got out of the house when those squares, in my teenage mind, when those squares came to our house. And wouldn't you know it, when the bank was over and I got home, they were still there. And one of those preachers sat down with me, and I didn't know what he was doing. I do now. He was fishing and trying to win my soul. And he sat down and talked to me about basketball. Now, someone would have said he's a compromiser. No, he wasn't. He never went to a game I played in and watched me play, but he was defanging me and I didn't know it. My hackles, my defense, everything was up. I, I can remember it to this day as a 16 or 17 year old boy thinking, this guy's not so bad after all. And then I went to hear him preach. He preached against everything I was sneaking behind my parents' back. It was like they told him, but they didn't know. But God knew. And you know what? I loved it. I knew where I was going to church. That man wasn't true. He wouldn't buy a television. The mechanic in town told my dad this. He was laughing about it. Your preacher was in here today, and he said he'd buy a television, but some of his members wouldn't like it. Well, his, his boys, one of my age, one of them two years younger, they bought one, put it in the parsonage in their bedroom, and I'd go over there and watch and he came in the bedroom watch with us. I didn't have much respect for him, much confidence in him. He never preached against the sins I was involved in. But this man, I mean, he poured it on me without mercy. But you know what? I knew he loved my soul. And he was probably, well, without doubt, the most influential preacher. Other people played a part but the most influential in helping me find God. Well, thank God. I know you all have stories and heard part of Brother Presley's tonight, and it blessed my heart. Psalm 93. I'm only going to read one verse as I did this morning, and I'll ask you to stand. If you're not up to it and your bones hurt, I understand. You don't have to get up, but at least in your heart, honor the Word of God. <laughs> Psalm 93, verse number 5. <clears throat> I went to see my doctor the other day, and I said, Doc, you know these jokes about old people? That when they get down 
on the floor to get something. While they're down there, they think about anything and everything else that could be done while they're there. I said, that's not funny. I told I said, why don't you, he just lives a block from me. I said, I don't see you jogging by my house anymore. And it used to be five o'clock in the morning, I'd see him. He said, well, I've got a bad knee. I said, you get in shape. I don't want to come see an old broken down doctor. I want you in good shape when I come see you. <clears throat> well, thank the Lord. Psalm 93, verse five. Thy testimonies are very sure. Holiness becometh thine house, O Lord, forever. Father, bless thy word. Help me to say everything you want said that will be edifying and beneficial to our souls. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. <clears throat> the declaration of the psalmist that I read to you is my text was applicable to the tabernacle that Moses was commanded to erect in the wilderness. It also is applicable to the tent that David had set up in Mount Zion and to the temple that Solomon had later on. Everything about those buildings was sacredly and solemnly set apart for holy purposes. They contained the holy place that was daily accessible for devotional exercises and the most holy place that God specifically, where God specifically manifested his presence, which was entered only once a year, and then by the high priest alone. But everything about that sanctuary was in keeping with the inscription that was engraved upon the plate of the holy crown of pure gold, that the high priest wore upon his mitre, which was the headpiece, and that statement was holiness unto the Lord. Those bit words are applicable to any church building that is sacredly set apart for purposes of divine worship. Nothing should be permitted to infringe upon the sacredness of the sanctuary. <clears throat> One church I was pastoring, we had a Christian school and, and a lot of children, young people. And uh, the uh, children kind of got out of hand. It, it, it got worse nearly every service for quite some time. So that was back when I was a younger man before I had all this wisdom. So <clears throat> one day in the pulpit I said, folks, the track meets in this sanctuary as of now have stopped. You parents are gonna get a hold of your children and make them behave in this sanctuary. If you fail to do your job, I will do it for you. And when I am through doing it, if you happen to be there and watch me perform what you should have done, when I get through, I will stand up straight and look you in the eye and decide whether or not you have the blessing. Like I said, that's back before I had all this wisdom. But you know, it helped. And one night, we had an altar service, and the altar overflowed, and there were seekers at that front pew, and I was there praying with some of them. And here came two little fellas. I mean, they were tearing down that aisle. And I looked up and saw them coming, and they saw me. They came sky skidding to a stop <laughs> and walked carefully by me. And uh, I never told them, but it, it made me grin inside out. <laughs> Those little fellows were pretty cute. But it still remains. We need to treat this as God's house. <clears throat> In Korea, when you go into any building, you take off your shoes. And uh, my host was not bashful to tell me that, even in the hotel room that he rented for me. Now in Korea, it's also a hotel. You don't say motel. That's a low place in Korea. You use the term motel. You're not. So I, I learned that. <clears throat> but I got into the hotel room where I would be staying by myself, and I hadn't taken my shoes off, and he was still with me, and he told me, take your shoes off. So I took my shoes off until he was gone. But uh, <clears throat> one church, it was the biggest 
church, I don't know if it's the biggest crowd, but that church would seat probably 2,000. It was downtown Seoul. The pastor's study was on the fourth floor, and uh, <clears throat> it had, in the corner, there were windows, two, two walls, windows, where you overlook the city of Seoul, 12 million people. And then uh, uh, there's a big room, big uh, books he had. I didn't read any of them. They're all in Korean. But uh, one whole wall full of that, of, of books and so on, and uh, some very nice <clears throat> chairs for other people besides him. But uh, anyway, in that church, <clears throat> I watched him, the pastor, and when he walked up on the platform, some churches, they'd let you keep your shoes on if you didn't get on the platform. So in that church, I watched him. He walked all the way up to the top and never took his shoes off. Boy, did I appreciate that man. <laughs> so I walked all the way up and never took my shoes off and preached that way. But as in another church, and that church had a pool table on the fourth floor. It was the youth uh, floor, youth room. And uh, they had a banner across the whole street welcoming myself and another preacher that was with me. But uh, in that church, you could wear your shoes uh, until you got up to the platform. Some of them you had to take it off so you came in. I remember one place after I was through preaching, I went back looking for my shoes and all I could see was a pile of shoes. And it was interesting, Every it, nice dress shoes. Korea, is, as far as being advanced, they're very advanced and uh, <clears throat> very well off financially. But uh, I looked at that pile of shoes, they weren't piled, but all over the place and the backs of these nice dress shoes broken down <laughs> where these guys kept putting their feet in uh, every place they'd go inside and in the stores you didn't have to take your shoes off. And I couldn't find my shoes. And uh, one of the young fellows saw me looking and he ran, they had a special compartment and they had taken my shoes and separated them and stuck them in a, a special uh, little cubby hole type door to protect them. And, uh, and then he just brought them to me just like a servant and, and they're so kind over there. But uh, anyway, this one place where I, I came up and, and sat in the front seat and they had a band, it was awful. They had the drums, they had this, uh, it was terrible. I, I, I nearly felt like doing that, like that guy did in, in the Brooklyn Tabernacle when I was there uh, once for a service. I was in the balcony, I was looking right down, and that church used to be a, a theater. And they've got this place for, I, I think it was an organ, though I, it was, seemed like more than an organ. Maybe it's some kind of synthesizer, I don't know, but, but they had two of those. And uh, in the middle, they had a guy with the cymbals, great big cymbals. And they, they played this song, and I was looking right down watching them. And uh, it ended on a crescendo. And the guy with those cymbals, he reared back, and he brought them together as hard as he could. And as soon as he did, I'm not going to do what he did, because it would make my, ear, my uh, hearing aids whistle at me. <laughs> But anyway, immediately he just clapped his hands over his ears while that thing just, you know. And uh, anyway, interesting. But here they had this, the racket was, I'll tell you what, it was not a spirit of worship. And so it came time for me to get up on the platform to preach. And I headed there, and most Koreans are smaller than I am. Not all of them, but most of them, they're smaller people. But they had a, a uh, what would you call them, slippers? I don't know. They had a special uh, slipper or whatever that you could put on, but you had to take your shoes off. So they, they had them right there for me. And they were bigger size, so I could fit my, my feet in them. And I took one look at them, and this thought occurred to me. I wonder how many men have worn those. <laughs> And I took off my shoes and sidestepped those slippers they had for me and went up and knelt on the platform, which is something they very, well, I don't guess they ever did but unless, until I had all the services. But, but anyway, I knelt on the platform to pray. And after I was through praying, I, 
I got up from my chair and turned around and somebody had brought those things up there for me. So I put them on. Now something else they had besides that awful racket, they had a quartet sing a special. And uh, I think it's three boys and one girl. They were about 20 years of age. The girl, can you believe this? This was supposed to be Holman's Church. She had short shorts on. And uh, you know what my text was? The very one I'm using tonight. I probably said some things I won't say here tonight. And I preached on reverence in the house of God. And then I preached on holiness. Interestingly, my host was not with me there that Sunday morning service. He, had, he went to some other church. <clears throat> he had my co-worker at another church. His son uh, drove me to this church. And uh, when we got in the car, he, he said, asked me how I liked the service. I said, David, that wasn't his Korean name, but that's what we call him. I said, David is terrible. I said, that was God's grief of that kind of stuff. I said, that racket is more like a rock band than a worship service. And those young people singing a special on God's holy platform, as immodest as could be, people weren't worshiping God. He said, I'll tell my father. I said, fine. And uh, he told his father. That night, I was in a motel. That room was so small, you had to go outside to change your mind. <laughs> And here came David's father. And he said, David, tell me what you think about the service. He said, that's why he spoke pretty good English, but it's kind of like I'm telling, just a little broken, but he did well. He said, that's why I'm glad you're here. I find out these things. And uh, so in came the pastor of that church and another pastor. And they had their business suits on. And uh, they sat down. There was room for them, barely, to sit down on the floor while my host and I were sitting on my bed. And my co-worker was in a chair. There was one chair. And, but, I mean, it, it was close communion, for sure. And they no more got seated than my good brother began to work them over. Now, I couldn't understand what he was saying. But I could understand by his demeanor and by the faces on these preachers that were about 40 years of age. And this brother that invited me over is about my age. Actually, there's six months difference uh, in us. I, I knew he was working over. And he, it was, oh, 10, 15, 20 minutes that he, as the saying goes, told them how the cow ate the cabbage. Then he got through. He turned to me and in English he said, I tell him about the service and about these things. Now you tell him. <laughs> so I told him. <laughs> but oh, the heartache of seeing people in the drift, whether it's in this land or another land. He said to me, and I've, I've, <clears throat> I'm like the one preacher that, that said he took a text and he departed from it. And the preacher responded to that and said, well, I don't use a starter on my car the whole time I'm driving it. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, <clears throat> he said, what is it, anything about the way we operate that you don't like? I said, yes. There are two things I don't like. I get through preaching, convictions on, God's dealing with souls, and you get up there and have somebody lead them in a, a, a pepped up song and they sing away all the conviction that was on. And you don't have an altar where they can come and seek God. He said, oh, the altar said, we can't do that. It's our culture, our people are very bashful. I said, they are not, they're full of carnal pride. He didn't put an altar in, 
And he did tell me this. He said, when you come to the close of the service, you do whatever you want. You are my teacher. I said, thank you, I will. Though he did not bring an altar in, he had men ready. And as soon as I gave the altar call, he pushed back, he had those men push back the seats, and we had an opening, and there were probably maybe 100 people there that night. And I would judge there were about 50 people on their knees. You talk about praying. There was one preacher that said, I wanted the Spirit of God tonight. The Spirit of God has come and filled my soul. But I think it was in that service where someone began to speak in tongues. Now, I can't speak Korean and I can't understand it, but I know when it's not. And I knew that was not. Well, I got him up and I gave him a sermon on the tongues. Went from there to another church. And it happened that one of the leaders in speaking in tongues was a pastor's wife. And it was her husband's church I was now preaching in. And uh, I didn't wait till an altar service. In my sermon, I explained the tongues. And explained why it was wrong. And to me, it just, it's beyond my comprehension how anybody could read chapter 2 and think that the tongues is an evidence of the Holy Ghost when it said every man heard them speak in his own tongue wherein he was born. That's as simple and as clear as you can make it. Anyway, I explained to him that the only thing mimic is the tongues. They can't mimic the uh, rushing mighty wind. They can't mimic the tongues of fire. But they can put on the, the gibberish. And anyway, I took more time than that. But after that sermon, and I opened the altar, and they did have an altar in that church. And here we had that altar line, I think wall to wall, if I remember right there. And one of the women went in the tongues. And I got down in front of her, and I got my interpreter over here. I said, sir, I want you to stop her. Oh, she's praying. I can't stop her. I said, I want you to stop her. And oh no, she's praying. I said, I told you to stop her. You stop her and you stop her now. Oh, oh, okay. So he stopped her. So through him, I asked her why she was there. She said that her mother-in-law was, I think, a Hindu, which shocked me in Korea. That's big in India, but not Korea. But it was some false religion like that, Buddha or whatever. And uh, under her pressure, she had caved in and had backslidden and lost God out of her heart. I said, you tell her just to talk to God just how she talked to me. And not give in to emotion. God's a person and he's intelligent. And you tell her to tell God what she just told me and tell God how sorry she is. And she calmly knelt there, and I could tell she was now speaking in Korean to God. And it wasn't long. Now before this, she was going like this. And in this unknown gibberish, when I had to stop her. And after a while, the tears started coming. And she began to weep, and there was a brokenness of spirit. And you could sense it, and in a little while, her face lit up. And she testified of the forgiveness of God. Yes. And in that very service, we had several testimonies, and one preacher got up and said, I was planning tomorrow to walk out on my wife, but God has forgiven me of my sins, and I'm going to start back serving God and put my home together the best I can. God had, had given us some wonderful victories. And I'll tell you one experience I had while I'm off on I'm Korean. I, my board doesn't want me going overseas anymore, so I may have made my last trip. <clears throat> and my wife's not bored, but she didn't want me going over anymore either. But anyway, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> my doctor said it's fine. But I thank God for the victories he gave us. But one morning about 6 o'clock, I was on a bus with my co-preacher. And I turned to him and I said, Brother, 
somebody's praying for us right now. I think there's, I forget, 10 hours difference. And we got home and got to checking and we found that there were two people at that very hour, the Korean time, the same time. It was in the afternoon in the United States. They were praying for us and we knew it. And so don't discount prayer. Whether you feel anything or not, God works. So praise God. Well, holiness. I'm, I'm just going to briefly give you uh, not this whole sermon. I don't have time for that. I've taken time talking about other things. But th this question, what is holiness? And I told you this morning we use the term holiness interchangeably with sanctification, and that's really incorrect, and I'm guilty. But every once in a while I try to do like I did this morning and explain the, the difference that holiness is the life. But when we talk about holiness, and we're told in the Bible, Peter said, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Leviticus is the Old Testament book of Hebrews, the Old Testament book of unholiness. But when you talk about holiness, this needs to be understood. It is not absolute holiness. That belongs only to God. It is not angelic holiness. Now, a number of angels fell. And they are no longer on probation. But there are angels that are still holy angels. And as I said, holy angels. But the holiness that we obtain is not angelic, for those angels have never fallen. And then it is not a holiness that will result in the uh, uh, perfect life in the estimation of men. God spoke to Abram and then changed his name to Abraham. By the way, that Abraham, that is the central sound of God's unpronounceable name, Jehovah. Jehovah is the same as the I am that is found in Exodus 3. But he said to Abraham, Abram, he said, walk before me and be thou perfect. He did not say walk before Lot and be perfect. And if you walked with God in a sanctified experience any amount of time, there are probably people, unsaved relatives, that may have said either to you or about you, if that's holiness, I don't want it. Uh, I had a relative that was upset at me and wouldn't speak to me for about a year because I would not allow my children to participate in her sin. And uh, so she might not have liked my holiness. You know, I don't know. I, I know in one point some relatives were tired of us shoving our convictions down their throats. We hadn't said a word. We, we just lived the way God wanted us to live. As far as my part was concerned, I was tired of them trying to shove their sin and worldliness down our throats. <laughs> but anyway, it's not a holiness that's going to please everybody else. And it's not Adamic. It's not the holiness Adam had before the fall. It is not a holiness that will exempt you from temptation. I pastored a man... <clears throat> He got saved out of the rough. He and his wife were not raised in a church. She told me, or I heard her testify, that she grew up in America and didn't even know who Jesus Christ was. But they got saved and started looking for a church. They went into a tongues church. It was in a revival meeting, and the preacher said that he came right to this man and pointed him out and said, after Wednesday of this week, you will no longer be tempted. And though he didn't know much, he knew that wasn't right. He told me, he said, when he said that to me, I knew that wasn't the church God wanted us in. Well, he had enough sense to know that. But sometimes the devil attacks people that are conscientious and walking in the light and just attacks them and accuses them when they've been tempted, though they have not sinned. You know, an individual that gets sanctified holy will many times feel worse about facing a temptation 
than they used to feel when they committed the actual act before they were saved. Because God has changed their, their being so much. There's a sensitivity to sin and they're just grieved that a temptation even came. But God kept them and if he kept them, that's, that's holiness in action. And he will keep you if you let him. Then it does not uh, talk about a, a completed experience because there is unending growth. Actually, we'll continue to grow after we get to heaven, spiritually. We'll still be finite and God will be infinite. We'll be learning about him throughout eternity. Well, what is it then? It is not the inability to sin. We've been accused of teaching a perfection that once you get sanctified, it's impossible to sin. No credible wholeness teacher has ever taught that. Some that are not credible perhaps have. No, it is not the inability to sin. It's the ability not to sin. Thank God. Well, it is a holiness of a fallen but redeemed human being. And this holiness can be enjoyed and lived by an individual that is subject to the human infirmities that he is surrounded by, all the circumstances incident to human life, he can still live an upright life of holiness and be kept by the power of God. It implies a heart that is thoroughly cleansed from all sin, both inherited and acquired, and filled with the spirit of purity. Well, is it possible to obtain this? Well, you know the answer to that. First of all, God commands it. First Peter 1, which I've already alluded to, but as he which, verse 15, has called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Matthew 5, 48, be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Then the promises of God. There are many scriptures. I could give you many more, but I'm going to just move quickly. The promises of God clearly teach that it's possible. Uh, I'll give you one. Luke 1, 68. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for hath visited and redeemed his people. Verse 72. To perform the mercy promised to our fathers, to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to our father Abraham that he would grant unto us that being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him in holiness all the days of our lives. So that is a promise and there are more promises. First John 1, 9, one of the most familiar. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth us from all sin. Then it's also proven, another proof that it's possible to obtain is the fact that this was the very purpose of the life and death of Jesus Christ. Titus 2.14, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good work. Again, there are many more scriptures uh, that would bear that out. And I'll give you Ephesians 1, 4, which I'm sure you're familiar with. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we might be holy and without blame before him in love. So before he ever created one celestial globe, he had the purpose and will that you and I should be made holy and serve him in holiness. Well, then also the prayers of, of inspired men are directed towards this very thing that that we be sanctified holy Jesus himself I preached about about that prayer this morning and uh, Paul first uh, Thessalonians 5 23 and the very God of peace sanctify you holy and I pray God your whole spirit soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in verse 24 faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it We could give you a list of people that have experienced it, people in the Bible. There's Enoch that lived ahead of his generation and and Stephen, of course, with a holy heart and a 
tremendous attitude of forgiveness said, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And we we're told before his martyrdom, we we're told that he was a man that was full of faith and Barnabas also full of the Holy Ghost. And so sanctified uh, people, there are people that have experienced it. And there are people in this room tonight that uh, testified that they have experienced it and that it's up to date. And thank God uh, for that. Thank God that I have experienced it. I'm not worthy, but I thank God that he did that very thing for me. Well, then how? How can it be obtained? Well, first of all, you have to believe it's possible. And then there'll have to be an earnest desire and diligent seeking for it and a determination to seek until it's found. It takes a complete consecration. Now I've heard it said, some have said that, well, no, it's not consecration. Actually, one great man wrote a book and in that book on holiness, he said that you get saved, you consecrate to get saved, you take the death route to get sanctified. Folks, that is not true. Now, yes, you take the death route to get sanctified, but when you're not saved, you don't have a thing to consecrate. And uh, so I've heard it said that, well, you preach consecration, that's a shallow holiness. You need to preach death route. Well, I do preach death route, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, and that means done away with. And there's an attack even in the holiness movement today against eradication. Well, brother, sister, that is a Bible doctrine. That term is not used in the Bible, but it's a Bible-based term. And uh, they say, well, the, the word, it, it's referring to something tangible you can get a hold of. Nonsense. It is not. And what, are the, what does the medical field mean when they talk about eradicating a virus or a disease? They mean getting rid of it. And so you get rid of carnality. And yes, there is a death to self. But listen, in studying the Bible, I have discovered that if you preach Bible consecration, there is nothing shallow about it. Because the Holy Ghost does not overlook a thing. And it amounts to this. You've gotten saved, your sins are forgiven, you're walking with God. And uh, uh, the first work of grace was complete, a perfect work in itself. It's not a halfway religion. It does exactly what God intended for it to do. But now there's another operation that needs to take place, and that is to take out this nature with which we are born. And that takes eradication, but it takes a Bible consecration to be qualified. I touched on that this morning, didn't develop it uh, in, in length or depth, but it amounts to a contract. And uh, when you're signing a contract, it might be wise to read the small print, especially dealing with certain people. But on this contract, it amounts to a blank sheet of paper. And at the top is a heading. The heading is a covenant between God and me. But it is blank, but at the bottom there is a line for a signature. And if you're making the consecration, that line is for your signature. And you sign that, and then you hand it back to God, and you say, all right, now you fill it in. That is Bible consecration. In other words, there I've heard it said, well, I got sanctified and this came along. I had to die out to that nonsense. You die out to the carnal nature. God eradicates it and that's gone and you don't have any more dying out to do. Either the carnal nature is dead or it isn't dead. And if it's dead, it can't die and there's nothing to die. So there is not this piecemeal Keswickian Calvinic Calvinistic mix. There is a crisis experience where the heart is cleansed by the power of the Holy Ghost. You come up against things you didn't know that you'd ever face, but you settled that when you handed the blank covenant sheet back to God and self it said, fill it in, and he wrote that in. Something you didn't know was coming, but you already said yes to it when you took your hands off of your life and became God's and God's alone, and you don't claim yourself anymore. You're not your own. You belong to God. Well, praise God for that wonderful experience of holiness. But I want to tell you something. You can do all that and still be unsanctified. 
You don't get anything from God in any other way but by faith. Now it is true that the death route, this Bible consecration, lays a groundwork for faith to become operative. If you have covered sin, if you have disobedience, that's not faith, that's presumption. If you're claiming victory over the top of things that God doesn't want in your life. But if you have come to the end of yourself, I will never forget that. I knew, I knew that God himself couldn't bring anything up to me. Oh, of course he could bring up things I hadn't thought of. My memory and my mind is limited, but he couldn't bring up anything but what my heart would say immediately, well, yes, I didn't think of that, but yes, this was already said. I remember when I got there. I knew, I knew. I, I, I remember saying, I reckon myself dead indeed unto sin. And I should have stepped on the promise of God then, but about 24 hours later, I did. <laughs> and he didn't fail. Praise God for the cleansing blood and his honoring our faith. I pastored a man that said, I had to come to the place where I gave up what I called my right to doubt God. We're sanctified by faith. And faith becomes operative when we get to the end of ourselves. Holiness becometh thine house, O Lord, forever. Let's stand together, please.